the clock. Okay, welcome everyone. This is our sixth session on seminar 18. Um, we took a, a break. It's now summertime, so we took a break last week. Um, the session from the, I guess the fifth session ended on a very interesting conversation on the phallus and Lacan made a reference to the participants of the seminar that they ought to reference his seminar on the purloined letter, which was, I suppose, delivered in um, the early 1960s, I think, um, which obviously appears in the Acree. And so I had, per Lacan's recommendation, sent an email for everyone to take a look at sections 31 through 40 in the Acree of the Purloin letter. And those are numbered, if you can see my screen, on the side, it's not the standard pagination up here, right? So you pay attention to that, which is kind of like the universal numbering. And what we find here, we find immediately why this section of Purloin letter is of significance for seminar 18, because he's, he's referencing at the very beginning of this excerpt, the yin, yin and the yang, which he referenced before, you'll remember when he's talking about Mencius and Confucian conceptions of harmony in nature and um, the non-sexual rapport. So that's referenced. Um, <clears throat> um, and he's gonna, well, he's gonna give the overview. So let's, let's actually, I don't wanna say too much about it. Typically I say like, um, a little bit of, of um, commentary before we begin, but I think tonight I'd rather jump right in, in part because I've been very busy with other projects. Um, and so we can feel free to sort of read this. Anyone stop at any point for questions, clarifications, comments, etc. cetera. Um, so let us begin. Can everyone see the text okay from their screen? Good, okay, all right. So seminar six, Wednesday, the 17th of March, 1971. As regards the seminar on the Purloin letter, I don't know yet what it may yield. And then here he's having this kind of uh, very silly uh, back and forth with a student in the audience. Um, for example, in one case, I might ask someone to leave the room. In extreme case, in an extreme case, I might have an attack of nerves and leave the room myself. In another case, in the other amphitheater, it was a bit too much like the majority of cases where people think a sexual relationship exists because you are stuck together in a sardine tin. This is going to allow me to ask you to raise your hand. You will remember this whole business that when a um, group has a sort of awareness of itself as abi abiding by a sexual harmony or a sexual relation that there that there that it is extant or it is efficacious. He likes to reference the sardine tin. That's a very interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, who are the people following my explicit suggestion that made the effort to read pages thirty-one through forty of what is called my decree? Anyway, lift your hand all the same. Here you can raise your hand. There are not as many as all that. I don't know if I might not have an attack of nerves simply to leave because in short, it is necessary to have some minimal resources to ask someone what relationship he was eventually able to sense in these pages. Who feels in the mood? You see, I'm very nice. I'm not channeling anyone who feels himself in the mood to say something. Why not? That there is scarcely any way of seeing it. Would someone be kind enough to communicate to me some of the reflections that may have inspired in him so he's, he's testing the audience to see if they can give a summary of the uh, passages. They give a summary and then Lacan basically kicks this person out of the seminar because they've failed in their summary. Um, he says, so you haven't reread them. Get the hell out of here. Anyway, it's very annoying. You don't expect me to read them for you, do you? That really is asking too much of me. But anyway, I take it as it comes. I'm a little bit astonished all the same. I'm a little bit astonished not to be able to get an answer unless I take a teasing line. 
Yes, all the same, it is very annoying. In these pages, I'm very precisely only speaking about the function of the phallus insofar as it is articulated, as it is articulated in a certain discourse. And this was never, was nevertheless not a time at which I had even sketched out the construction of this whole variety, this tetrahedric uh, combination with four vertices that, that I presented to you last year. That's the discourse, the mappings of the discourse. And I note nevertheless, from this level, one cannot say from this level, I mean of my construction from this time, if you also wish I directed my attack, as I might say, this is saying a lot, to being able to shoot. It is already that in such a way that it seems to me now not to be misleading. I mean, in a further stage of this construction. Naturally, when I said the last time, I let myself go like that, especially when it is necessary to pretend one is breathing. I said the last time that I admired myself. I hope that you do not take that literally. What I was admiring was in effect rather the outline that I had created at a time when I was simply beginning to plow a certain furrow as a reference point, which is not now to be completely rejected, which does not make me feel ashamed. It was on this that I ended last year. And it is rather remarkable. One might even perhaps take something from it, an outline like that, encouragement to continue. That it is altogether striking that everything that can be caught in it is pechable, eh, as I might say, in terms of the signifier, is there. This indeed is what is at stake. I started to fish from this seminar on the Purloin letter on, and I think that after all this time, the fact that I put it in first place in spite of any chronology showed perhaps that it was necessary that I had the idea that it was in short the best way to give an introduction to my agree. So then the remark that I make about this famous man who dares all things, those unbecoming as well as those becoming a man, it is quite certain that if I insisted at the moment to say that not to translate it literally, say uh, qui est indigne, asi bien que si que est, Digne de homme shows that it is in a block that the unsayable, shameful aspect, what is not said as regards what concerns a man, is indeed there in a word the phallus. Okay. And it is clear that it is clear that to translate it by fragmenting it in two, se qui es digne de homme aussi bien que, que si que es that what I am insisting on here is that it is not the same thing to say, quote, the robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber. So the robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber, does everybody remember that from Poe's purloin letter, this whole idea? It's a very um, interesting point that the Purloin letter was actually a text written largely about cybernetics. In that sense, it's very similar to game theory and Lacan's interest in this whole business of how one makes a decision with a lack of knowledge of the other's position, which is like one of the um, problematics of game theory. And so I could refer you to a wonderful secondary literature article on the Purloin Letters Seminar, which actually shows its direct linkage to the question of game theory. <clears throat> because in the uh, analysis that Lacan uh, provides, what he tries to show is that um, the knowledge of the content of the letter the inside of it, its meaning, is only ascertainable when you sort of, um, or it rather is not ascertainable by the characters caught up within the drama of the story itself, because they lack a understanding of the kind of motivation or the desire of the other. Precisely that the robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber is not present. So it's a, we would have to go back to the seminar. I was rereading it today. It's highly complex, but just to know this is sort of the background 
that it's this kind of game theory question of this mm, fundamental missing of meaning, missing of the sign uh, significance of the status of the letter. And there's this whole business, which is that what really matters in the ascertainment of the letter is the position of each subject caught within the drama, right? And that their position of meaning in relationship to the letter, um, that the letter actually takes on the status of the phallus and then you have a kind of um, distribution um, accordingly. And so that's a slight background for those that are less familiar with this. I can see why after rereading it today, it's such a um, often cited example for literary studies, because in point of fact, I had the sense that Lacan is really trying to uh, metaphorize a lot. He's trying to sort of take this story by Edgar Allan Poe and kind of show how transference, the phallus, and all of his concepts can fit into it. Um, but purely as a kind of analogy. You see, he's using kind of a lot of um, anal logic by way of analogy, I've noticed. Okay. So th this element of knowing who knows, namely by having imposed a certain fantasy of oneself, precisely the man who dares everything, is here, as Dupin says right away, the key to the situation. Okay. I am saying that, I am saying that, and I'm going to come back to it, because to tell the truth, what I indicated to you could have for someone who would have taken the trouble, allowed there to be advanced directly in a text like this, most of the articulations that I will perhaps have to develop to unfold and construct. As you are going to see, if you do not mind, in a second phase after having heard what I will more or less have succeeded in saying. It was in fact well and truly written there and not simply written there with all in the same necessary articulations, those that I believe I have to take you through. So then everything that is there is not simply sieved and bound. It is clearly made up of signifiers that are available for a more elaborate meaning. That in short of a teaching, my own, that I can say is without precedent other than that of Freud himself. And precisely in so far as it defines the previous one in such a way that one must read its structure in its impossibilities. <clears throat> okay, so we haven't even talked about where the signifier resides within the drama of the detective story of the purloin letter and the way that the letter and its distribution function similar to a signifier. And for that, Lacan wants to draw out the um, example of how the analyst um, forges a type of commitment to an impossible um, interpretation of an irrational signifier. And he calls that a fetish, right? He calls that a fetish at, uh, in fact, at page 31, which calls it a fetish because for the side of feminine, of the side of the feminine, which relates to the letter, uh, he, in an interesting passage I could quote for you, he refers to it as a fetish. So um, that's significant, why? Because as we were actually examining last night in a very interesting seminar on fetishism, you'll remember that the logic of the wider theme of seminar 18 of the semblant of semblance is takes on the structure of a fetish right it there it meaning that it's a stand in for another semblant and then it becomes an ontological question as to whether there is a truly real or like how the semblant is a necessary cover over for the void this is a theme that we've looked at in this seminar. And so it's interesting in that uh, the Purloin Letter seminar, he's referring to the kind of um, movement of the signifier also as a fetish. So that's something to, to consider. Okay. Daniel, I just not to stop you, but I, I just so I have some uh, 
semblance, haha, of like a, a, a figure for this. Like in the early weeks of this, of us going over the seminar, you discussed a flag on a battlefield and then a flag like oh, yeah. inside a house. Yeah. Like, so this cup, this, this like dual nature that you're talking about is not unheimlich. It's not, because I remember reading the Grig and he talks about the scarecrow and that's not the semblant, but rather the, like the, rather the, your example of the flag started to make a little bit more sense to me in the sense yeah. as it acts that the flag in the house acts as a fetish because it represents a whole mode of, I don't know. I, I guess I'm lack, I, I'm just lacking the words, I guess, to see where, how that, how that example. To how yeah, the so the, the, the distinction, the distinction that Lacan was offering at that point in the seminar was actually between artifact and mm. semblance, right? So an artifact would in fact be a flag that's removed from the scene of signification. Oh, okay. So the flag, when it's caught up in a battle or a memorialization or a ceremony, it's caught up within semblance. Its meaning is not stable. It's being ascribed almost in a metonymy, a metonymy right? Mm -hmm. Whereas when I hang it on the wall or when it's frozen or removed from a scene of signification, that's what Lacan calls an artifact. And remember he mentioned this notion that um, there are artifacts and semblances all throughout nature. And he tried to make a distinction there, um, but, that, but that there are some phenomena of nature, such as a lightning strike or a rainbow, which don't actually produce an artifact. They are purely of semblance, right? Because they don't leave a mark per se. They may leave a kind of trace or an effect, like they burn down a, a forest or something from the lightning but they don't really leave an artifact. So he was playing with this kind of distinction and he used the wonderful rich metaphor of the blood on the, on the ground in the bar as an, as an example of an artifact, as opposed to a semblance. Um, I think in part because it's a signification is um, pulpy, it sticks in the same way it's purloined in a certain sense, right? So we don't have time to go through the purloined letter, but after rereading it today, it does make me realize how important it is um, <clears throat> as an early Lacan intervention, seminar, etc. So it makes sense that he's going back kind of to it because in, in this seminar, it's raising some of these sort of questions about sign, signifier, phallus. And I think at the time, he hadn't yet developed this notion of semblance. So perhaps in a way he's sort of revisiting the seminar um, with this new concept in mind in a way. So I don't know if that's helpful, John, but hopefully some of that clarifies. Any follow-up? No, totally. I, I, I was just, I, I was wondering, I, I... I was seeing the fetish in maybe the artifact, but now I understand how. No, no, no. The, the, fetish, the fetish is more of a general logic of simply a object substitution, right? So you have in perversion fetishist disavowal, right? So you also have in, according to Freud, you have a kind of structure. Reality itself is structurally fetishistic in a certain sense. That doesn't mean that reality is um, neurotically fetishistic or that there's a symptomatic form of fetishism, but what Lacan is saying apropos um, the fact that all discourses um, exchange in semblance, um, it, it, it means that in, in a certain sense, um, semblance are exchanged for other semblance all the time. It's just, their exchange differs structurally across the logics of the movement of the discourses, right? But each one is exchanging in semblance, which is why we remember um, that beautiful essay about um, would, could there be a discourse 
that is truly not of a semblance, and remember the title of seminar 18 is of a discourse that might not be a semblance. Well, one such discourse would be what the author refers to as the discourse on philosophy, where this would be kind of um, a non-hystericized version uh, of, of, of Socrates' discourse, right? In which um, the real as a suprasensible mode of exchange, could you envision a way in which that form of the real, which is free and unencumbered from the necessity to put the fetish over its status, could something like that circulate? And the answer was this whole complex point about the distinction between speech and writing, right? Which <clears throat> is a major motif that we've looked at in this seminar as well. And that there's this huge debate between Derrida and Lacan about the kind of primary or originary position of speech versus writing. We know where Lacan lands on that. And we, this was a big focus in the last two sessions as well on the, on the necessity of the way in which um, the word, the way in which logos um, pre-situates uh, speech, which we can, we can talk about that. But um, the basic point there was that you can't really um, produce a discourse that would not be of semblance. And um, the closest you could get to that would be something like um, a mythical discourse, which would be quasi um, almost religious, right? Um, in the sense that it's kind of trying to put forward the notion that you can kind of circulate um, some representation of the suprasensible. But we know in Plato that um, writing does not capture the suprasensible. Why? Because writing cannot fully capture the act which has enjoyment bound up with it, right? So enjoyment latches on to the signifier in such a way that um, writing can only kind of capture a, always a partial form of it, right? Um, anyways, so in discourse and in writing, there's this kind of um, fundamental um, incompletion, I would say, and that um, even uh, Socrates, capturing the forms and rendering the super sensible truth. Um, what, what he tries to say about that, I think in a very nice way is that um, against logical positivism, uh, there's no conception in which the philosopher would ascertain truth without a theory of the act, i.e. without a theory of enjoyment also as tied up with that sign of the truth or that version of the truth or that expression of the truth, etc. So anyways, okay. So just remind <clears throat> me, what's that? I remember there's a quote by Lacan. I can't remember where it's from. It just comes to my head. He goes, um, it was something about neurotic. There's a, there was a misconception about neurotics um, when they're um, having perverse thoughts or um, fetishes, fetishism. And he says, neurotics don't have fetishes. They dream he says, and I can't remember what it's specifically from, mm. but, it, but it's, he says, he says that it's uh, neurotics don't have fetish, don't have fetish, fetishes, sorry, I'm being scouted here, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they dream and I'm, I'll try and find what, where it's from. Mm. It's just, it was an interesting quote in terms of uh, what the place where the, what the fetish is, how it, how it operates and how it circulates within, within modalities of subjectivity, you know, whether that's yeah. neurotic, hysteric, you know, et cetera. Anyway, just yeah. a lot. Yeah. That's very interesting. I'd love to see that quote. Um, I, think, I think that that makes sense, that the structure of the symptom of the neurotic um, is not structurally tied in with the, nece with the necessary fetish, with the production of a fetish object. That makes sense to me. But I'd love to see the quote. Okay. Let us move forward and if there's questions, we can continue. Can one say, properly speaking, for example, that Freud 
formulated this impossibility of sexual relationships, not as such. I am doing it simply because, and after all, it is very simple to say, it is written everywhere. It is written in what Freud wrote. It only has to be read. Only you are going to see later why you cannot read it. I am trying to say it, to say why I, for my part, do read it. The letter then, purloined, not stolen, but as I explain, I begin with that, which makes a detour. Or as I translate it for my part, the letter in souffrance, which is, uh, I think is, it means um, to suffer. In abeyance, actually. It means to suffer or to be in abeyance. Yeah, okay. Say again? Say again? Uh, it means, yes, to be in abeyance. The same term ah, actually okay. comes up in seminar 11. Um, I made a note of this. Uh, to the Touche, the re radical points of real amidst the pleasure system correspond those points of the real in abeyance, in souffrance. Abeyance, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I thought it was suffering, my bad, okay. Which makes sense because in the story, just as a reminder, the whole time Dupin was duping, <laughs> so to speak, the other characters by concealing the letter, right? Yet, yet despite that, it still had this signif signifying um, power, okay. So the letter is what is in abeyance. It begins like that and it ends this little decree with the fact that it arrives nevertheless at its destination. And if you read it, I hope that there will be a few more who will read it between now and the time I am going to see you again, which will not be in the near future, because all of this is very well calculated. The second and third Wednesday, I chose them because during the month of April, they fall during the Easter holidays. You will have the time to read the 40 pages of the Perlorian letter. At the end, I try to underline what is essential in it and why the translation of La Lettre Volée is not a good one. The Purloin letter, this all the same means, this all the same means that it reaches its destination. And I give the destination. I give it as the fundamental destination of every letter. I mean, epistle. It reaches, let us say, not even him or her or those that can understand nothing about it, including the police on this occasion. Naturally, they are completely incapable of understanding anything whatsoever. As I underlined and explained for a number of pages precisely, that is even why they were not able to find it about this substratum, this material of the letter. This is very prettily said, this invention, this magnificent fabrication of Poe. This letter is, of course, beyond the reach of explanation by space, since that's what's at stake. This is what the prefect has come to say, indeed, what the police, first of all, come to say which is that everything in the minister's house, given that they know that the letter is there, that is there so that he always has it within hand's reach. They say, why? That the space had literally been cross-ruled. It's amusing, right? To let myself go like that. I don't know, every time I allow myself a little from time to time to follow a certain slope, why not to certain considerations like that about space, this famous space which has been indeed for our logic for a good while, since Descartes, the most bothersome thing in the world. This is all the same a good occasion to talk about it, even if it is necessary to add it on as a sort of note in the margin, like something that I isolate, like something that I distinguish as the dimension of the imaginary. There are all the same people who worry themselves. And by the way, this is important for this notion of space. And remember this whole business of the knowledge of the other and lacking the knowledge of the other. Like, I don't know where the letter resides because I can't put myself in the position of somebody who's outside of my class and understand, not my class, but my, um, like, because he, Lacan says that once the king possesses the letter, all of the kind of spatial logics of presupposing the position of this person and that no longer adheres to the imaginary. And so what he's trying to actually say here is that, and this is very important apropos Lacan's contribution to cybernetics, because in the early conception of the imaginary, you have this Kojevian idea of the imaginary as a field of an absolute battle of prestige. And of course the aggression that goes with that 
But part of the um, tension that he wishes to show in the story is precisely that a large portion of the story, it's that subjects are caught in imaginary misrecognitions of the other's relationship to where the letter might be because they don't inhabit the same imaginary, so to speak. They don't have a shared symbolic in some sense, okay? Um, <clears throat> there you know, are- I'm sorry to stop you, but what, what, how is Dupin, is Dupin then special because he is like duped? Like you were saying that little-, little No, he duped thing. others. He, he dupes the others. others. So is, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I guess like what makes, I just, so the, the, what's makes him special is that he has, like he's masquerading or what I, I'm confused. I'm, maybe I'm using words that are too, like, I just wonder yeah. what makes him so special. That my, he, please. Oh, from my understanding, Dupin's whole benefit is he, you know, he knows well the rules of strategic calculus. In the original Poe story, if I remember it correctly, it's been a few years, but, um, Dupin recalls his time playing this game, and Lacroix mentions it in the seminar of That's even right. and odds. Right, he's able to read yeah. his opponents. Yes, right. um, I'll have more to say in a moment about this whole space thing because it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that can wait a moment. Some subjects in the drama of the story are caught in this kind of imaginary place, but I think Dupin, like. Aaron said has a kind of um, has a certain knowledge of um, the, the, the way that the signifier functions in the symbolic. So he has which the which the other characters lack. So I think in that sense, he's able to sort of work as an evil genius and manipulate the situation as well. Go ahead, Kyan. No, I want to hear from Aaron the, this thing about the three dimensions, the third dimension and the symbolic. And Daniel, you set it up quite nicely, but there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's, this is important. But, but uh, back to you, Aaron. Oh, that was, well, most of what I was going to say will be touched on a moment when we come to Descartes and how he distinguishes space and the order of thought, because there's a lot of different ways to read this. It's not clear at all. But um, one last thing I'll say, maybe this will make the example clear. Zizek actually gives this really good example in Less Than Nothing about the Pont de Capiton. He draws from, I think, Thomas Schelling, who talks about in strategic calculus, say, you and I need to meet up somewhere, right? And suddenly we lose contact with one another and we have no way of getting into contact with one another. We can naturally fall back on like assumed common location to meet up at, right? Lacan gives the example of like, you know, uh, the biggest, like, you know, imagine all the clocks went out in the city because every other clock was electric powered, except maybe the Tower of London, whatever, far fetched example. But anyhow, you can make that strategic inference and thus meet there. And this shows the way in which, in fact, the Pont de Capiton is irreducible to considerations of strategic calculus that is getting one up on the other, as it were. It transcends the, you know, kind of um, imaginary dyadic rivalry. Thanks. That's very helpful. That's very helpful. And I think, um, yeah, well, it would, it would be good for us to, to, to reread the, uh, the purloin letter as well. Um, Okay, and I like the fact that Lacan is bringing it back in, in part because this whole notion of Pointe Capitone or the kind of quilting point, you'll remember that one of the most important points of change that this seminar represents is that he's abandoning that notion of the relationship between signifier and puissance, right? So it's very interesting that he's kind of returning to Perloin letter in which such a uh, theory was very much, very much um, operating, right? Okay. 
there are all the same people who worry themselves, not necessarily about the decree, about others, or even also sometimes who kept notes of what I may have said at a certain time, for example, an identification. It was the year 1961-62, I must say, that all my listeners were thinking about something else, except I don't know one or two who came from outside who did not know what, exactly what was happening. I spoke there about the unary trait and people worry themselves now. It seems that this is legitimate about where this unary trait should be put. Should it be put on the side of the symbolic or the imaginary? Why not the real? In any case, just like because this is how it is passed on, a baton, ein Inzeigerzug, because it is, of course, in Freud that I picked that out. That is the kind of um, German phrase for which unary trait emerges. Um, this poses some questions since I introduced it to you a little the last time by this remark that it was completely impossible to think about anything whatsoever that holds up about this bipartition that is so difficult, so problematic for mathematicians. This is namely whether everything can be reduced to pure logic, namely to a discourse that is sustained by a well-determined structure. Is there not an absolutely essential element that remains, whatever we do to insert it into the structure, to reduce it, that all the same remains as a final kernel and that is called intuition? Assuredly, it is the question from which Descartes started. I mean, I would point out to you that mathematical reasoning as he saw it, extracted nothing efficacious, creative, anything whatsoever that was of the order of reasoning, but simply its start, namely an original intuition the one that is posited, established by its original distinction between space and thinking. Naturally, go ahead. Yes, this is the, the bit I want to desperately unpack because this is kind of, I, I didn't know quite what to make of this. Um, starting from the original distinction between space and thinking, um, yeah. You know, I think of, well, Descartes not super explicit about this, just in the meditations, he, you know, considers basic mathematical propositions like five, two plus three equals five, or that, you know, a square has four sides. And he says, I can't even be sure of this, right? Um, but then, of course, famously, Kant, in the refutation of idealism in the first critique, talks about, you know, um, the inevitable intertwinement of inner uns and also uns, uh, inner sense and outer sense, basically the temporal diachronic order of my thinking as ineluctably bound up with my sense of, you know, external spatiality. You know, I wouldn't have a sense of time without referring to a constant in space, right? Um, <laughs> Well, just practicing, so I, I, I take it, yes, th that is the half of Descartes' argument, is that he really maintains this distinction over against Kant. But um, I don't know, this, uh, the other thing I want to say here is it also kind of, I don't know, it seems possibly at odds with some of what Lacan seems to suggest in Seminar 13, <laughs> The object of psychoanalysis. Kopchak has a really good analysis of this, in which um, uh, Lacan seems to think that Descartes, for Descartes, thought is really consubstantial with the body, body. Contrary to what we might think about Descartes, contrary to the popular conception of Descartes, for Lacan, Cartesian thought essentially takes the form or thinking as Descartes conceived of it took on essentially an imaginary form. It was mm -hmm. sold to the finite form of the body, right? I don't know right. if this, this is because I, I think he integrally revises his reading of Descartes and the logic of fantasy. And so maybe that, you know, the reading from seminar 13 is kaput, but I was just wondering basically if anyone else had any thoughts on this irreducibility of space and thinking because, um, the other thing I thought of is, you know, he's talking about the Ein Einziger Zug, right? Yeah. And Einziger yeah. Zug, the unary or the letter, is something he, 
It's interesting. When he talks about the purloined letter seminar, he really puts an emphasis, as we've gone over, on the purloined aspect. And in that original seminar, he emphasizes the etymology of purloined. You know, um, that it comes from Latin prefix pro, which connotes something that stands as a, uh, as a uh, front to a back, um, even to stand in as its guarantor. And then the French um, suffix uh, loin, loignier, um, which is a verb meaning to uh, roughly set alongside. So he's already discussed the way that the police approach space in a certain fashion, right? Mm. And they mm. fail to make out the letter here. I think what he's yeah. pointing out is, you know, the way in which the letter, ein einziges unary, and remember, the letter always reaches its destination because it's fundamentally unary in its structure. Mm -hmm. um, the letter sits alongside signifying space, but it's mm -hmm. irreducibly different. He makes a remark somewhere here that the police uh, cross, crisscross the space, which yeah. th there's a this crisscrossing he talks about with regards to earlier uh, yeah. towards the theorization of the unconscious as a space of um, signifiers that are Vorschlunkenheit, I think is the German, which means literally crisscrossed. Mm. There's a d key distinction he's drawing here between the signifier in isolation, the letter, and signifier in relation. And yes. these are two different kinds of space. Yes. yes. And likewise, um, I, I've been reading Tom Iyer's wonderful Lacroix on the concept of the real, and he talks about, you know, within the theorization of primary narcissism or the, the mirror stage, again, um, that uh, the, the, you know, Lacroix will eventually come to uh, accord tremendous weight to the unary in that process. Right. That there is this element which sits amidst the, um, imaginary misrecognition, connaissance, um, that is integral to it, it's constitutive of it, and yet it subverts it. It always threatens to undo, unravel mm, it. Mm. And I, I don't know how to think of it. I, I think this, conjugate this, as it were, alongside this yep. distinction between space and thinking. <laughs> A lot great. there, I know. No, it's great. Really excellent intervention. I mean, I totally, I totally appreciate all of those um, lines of of inquiry that you've that you've laid out there. I mean, because last time a lot of the theory around um, the Greeks' conception of this strange excess that came from the establishment of a, of, a, of a signifier of science. And we'll see this in um, Euclid, Euclid. Like does Euclid uh, have the same origin or break uh, of original intuition that Cartesian science has? And I think the answer is it doesn't, which means that the Cartesian breakthrough instructs us in, in certain um, status of the subject of science in a, in a, that is a break, that is a rupture, right? And the great um, theoretician philosopher of science, Coire, uh, had already developed this theory of, of Descartes and Lacan had already um, spent a great deal of time on this notion. But why do you think that, um, Descartes begins with an original intuition. It's something having to do with this question of space and thinking. Obviously, Lacan will develop it, but if anybody wants to jump in, so, um, please. I mean, I'm just giving a sort of generalized idea, but, yeah. you know, in terms of reading, but all this, you know, Descartes can stuff, it's about these, um, you know, structures of mind, the separation between. Uh, conceptual apparatus and language are yeah. essentially separate realities in, in these thinkers. Uh, they take it for granted, you know, the, um, and, and Kant is the first to really come up with 
the you know transcendental apparatus and and how that sort of coheres with external reality etc but with lacan he he essentially understands that these that these this apparatus is caught up inherently with with language and um how that language is integrated into subjectivity is an inherently unstable uh, traumatic reality which can alter which ultimately leads to various subjective structures whether that's psychosis neuroses perversion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um but when he's talking about um original intuition i mean for i'm getting this is that the the on, on the unary trait the passing of the baton it's this con conception of a prior decision so a prior decision has to be made prior um, um, for us to be, to, to be able to e even engage in this type of reality. I think, is it in Less Than Nothing where, uh, where Zizek talks specifically about, um, is it Cartesian as, as, as madness? Which essay is it? Or is it in, in Umbra mm -hmm. where he talks about madness and how um, for, for, for Descartes to make any decision whatsoever, there needs to be a type of prior decision Absolutely. to sort of push madness. Am I getting this right? I don't know if we're from... Well, yeah, well. no, I mean, this is in, I think, the third meditation yeah. of, of Descartes, which revolves around this notion of the, the evil genius and the, the possibility that all of reality is created by uh, uh, some evil source and so on. So let's, let's actually keep on reading. Um, I don't want to go too far afield because we just simply won't finish. No, because I think, right. as always, uh, these questions are answered as we go, or, well, they get closer to being answered. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, this is good, though. Okay. Naturally, this Cartesian opposition between space and thinking, having been constructed more by a thinker than by a mathematician, one who is certainly not incapable of producing things in mathematics, as the effects have proved, was, of course, much more enriched by the mass math mathematicians themselves. It is indeed the first time that something came to mathematics by way of philosophy. Because I would ask you to note something which seems to me to be very certain. Let people contradict me if they can. It would be easy to find someone more competent than I on this matter. It is all the same very striking that the mathematician of antiquity should have for their part pursued their progress without paying the slightest attention to everything that might have been happening in the schools of wisdom in any of the schools of philosophy, whatever they may have been. It is not the same in our day, which is assuredly the Cartesian impulse concerning the distinction between intuiting and reasoning is something which has really tormented mathematics itself. This is indeed the reason why I cannot fail to find in it a, a vein, an effect of something that has a certain relationship with what here in the field that is at stake and that I am struggling with, and that it seems to me that the remark that I can make from the point that I am at about the relationships between the world and writing, about what there is, at least in this first line, about what there is special about the function of writing with respect to any discourse, is of a nature perhaps to ensure that the mathematicians notice what I indicated the last time, that the very intuition of Euclidean space owes something to writing. He didn't use the term intuition last time, but nonetheless. On the other hand, if, as I am going to try to push it a little further for you, what is called in mathematics logical research, logical reduction, a mathematical operation, is something that in any case is not going, cannot have any other support to notice it. It is, an, it is enough to follow history than the manipulation of small or big letters diverse alphabetical lots, I mean Greek letters or German letters, several alphabetical lots, any manipulation by which logistical reduction in mathematical reasoning is advanced requires this support. Okay, any manipulation by which logistical reduction in mathematical reasoning requires the manipulation of small or big letters. Okay, so we're, I'm not totally clear on that, but let's see if we can gain better sense. As I am repeating to you, I do not see the essential difference between it and what was for a long time, for a whole epoch, the 17th and 18th centuries, the difficulty of mathematical thinking, namely the necessity of a drawing for Euclidean proof. 
that at least one of these triangles should be traced out. And at this point, everyone gets frantic. This triangle that has been traced out, is it the triangle in general or a particular triangle? And this is what Levi, we discussed last time, and you helped us clarify that distinction. Because, because it is quite clear that it is always particular and that what you prove for the triangle in general, namely always the same story, namely that the three angles made by two straight lines. Well, it's quite clear that you must not say that this triangle has not the right to be at once an isosceles rectangle at the same time as being equilateral. Okay, so then it is always particular. This worried mathematicians a great deal. I pass over, uh, of course, this is not the place to recall it here. I am not here to show my erudition. Through what and from what this flows, since Descartes, Leibniz, or others, it goes up as far as Husserl. They seem to me all the same never to have been the real problem, that writing is there on both sides. It is indeed homogenizing, intuiting, and reasoning, that writing, in other words, little letters, has no less of an intuitive function than the one outlined by our friend Euclid. Okay. What is at stake all the same is to know why people think that this makes a difference. I do not know whether I ought to point out to you that the consistency of space or Euclidean space that ends with its three dimensions should, it seems to me, be defined in a quite different way. If you take two points, they're at equal distance from one another, as I might say, the distance is the same from the first to the second as from the second to the first. You can take three of them and arrange for it to still be true, namely that each one is equidistant from the other two. You can take four of them and organize it so that it is still true. I don't know, I have never heard that being explicitly highlighted. You can take five. Don't rush into saying that here also you can put them at equal distance from each of the other four, because all the same in our Euclidean space, you will not manage it. It is necessary in order to have five points at equal distance, you hear what I'm saying, from each of all the others, for you to fabricate a fourth dimension. There you are, naturally, it's very easy to the letter, and then it holds up well. It can be proved that a four dimensional space is perfectly coherent in the whole measure that one can show the link between its coherence and the coherence of real numbers. It is in this very measure that it can be sustained. But anyway, it is a fact that beyond the tetrahedron, already intuition has to be supported by the letter. I got into this in order to tell you because I said that the letter that reaches its destination is the letter that reaches the police who understand nothing about it. And that the police, as you know, did not come to birth today or yesterday, three pikes like that in the earth, three pikes in the campus, provided you know a little bit about what Hegel wrote, you will know that it is the state. <laughs> um, the state, and let me just finish this and we'll go back. The state and the police, for anyone who has reflected a little, one cannot say that Hegel takes up such a bad position in this regard, are exactly the same thing. It is based on a tetrahedric structure. In other words, once we put in question something like the letter, we have to leave my little schemas of last year, which are constructed, as you remember, like this. This is the discourse of the master, as you remember, characterized by the fact of the six lines of the tetrahedron and one is broken. It is in the measure that one makes these structures turn on the four lines of the circuit that follow one another in the tetrahedron. This is a, con a condition. Okay, so let's go back. All right. So the key point that he wishes to raise and, and highlight here is that in Euclidean space, if you want to have five points at equal distance, that's conditioned on the fabrication of a fourth dimension. Okay. <clears throat> and that, but, but even before that, in three or two, uh, you're, still, you're still working with intuition. So can someone um, elaborate a little bit on this notion of the fabricated fourth dimension? 
it's something you wish to sort of uh, give us a, a little exposition on this notion. I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, if, if you don't have to, it's, it's totally like, it's, it's all good. I, I have mean, a vague sense of it, but. I think it's, it's just a question of you know, the way I see it is a conversation and we can share our thoughts. I don't necessarily think my thoughts are going to be good, but uh, if someone wants to riff off them and, sure. uh, and what's it called and make them good, I'm quite happy to do that. That's, you know, it's just a question of openness and having a conversation about it. But uh, <laughs> of course. I think, there was one line in there that said, you know, about intuition uh, is predicated on the letter and, you know, yeah. little letters. Now, what is a little, the little letter? What's the little letter that Lacan yeah. talks about is object A, you know, little, small, small letter. Yeah. Um, I think, I, I, is he, is he analog, is sort of referencing that in some way? Mm, but, you, mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. it, you know, little letters. Uh, but I think it's this idea that this be things that we take ultimately for granted and, Yes, he's using intuition specifically in this very mathematical sense, but intuition to me, whenever it's referenced, is always rendering of, of the imaginary. And uh, the imaginary is always, you know, we're talking about a classicist. Uh, classicist Lacan is, a, you know, the, the, the imaginary in some way is always predicated on, on the symbolic. And he's just yeah. giving, he's giving... Uh, a rendition, a new rendition of of the symbolic, and he's doing it again through the purloined letter and bringing it directly in uh, to, to talk to talk about mathematics as well as that, mm -hmm. that, that's that's mm -hmm. all that, that's that's what I'm getting from it, and that's probably mm -hmm. wrong and superficial. But I, I <laughs> uh, um, but if anyone wants to riff off that or get uh, what did what did anyone else get from that? I don't know. With the yeah. big and small letters, those are Phrygian, you know, logical variables. You know, X is, you know, you have the little X, which is the um, variable argument. Uh, and then, you know, you, your, uh, your, your, big, um, your big letters, which are quantifiers. And then there's the phi, which is the function. Yes. Yeah. And he's going to introduce this, yes, later in the chapter. So. I think he's just anticipating that. Aaron's a maths head. I've got, I can't, I'm not good at the maths. <laughs> yeah. So I think also just to add off our conversation last week. Yeah. It seemed to me when reading this is that, um, you know, what Lacan, it seemed what he was saying in the last session is that there's something about Euclidean geometry that was presented as a universal, right? But in fact, it was precisely what allowed the Greeks to build an empire themselves for the Greeks. So um, if the Greeks, in essence, kind of if Euclid invents the three dimensions that are presented as natural and universal, mm. it makes sense to also invoke Descartes here and other Western philosophers later on who, yeah. who are, in a sense, fabricating a fourth dimension which yeah. is presented as universal universal yeah. man universal mind universal thought but in fact is used for a particular kind of empire and a particular reason it right and this goes this goes back empire. to the whole thing he was saying on the the principle of interest which is at the heart of the discourse of the master and that the confucian philosophers identified this in especially mencius as well and that um, it's almost, yeah, in a certain sense, the precondition for any discourse on, on knowledge, that it, that, it, that it be inserted there. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that the, the, the Confucian philosophers actually had a theory to account for this logic. Whereas I almost wish that to suggest that Lacan wants to point out that the Greeks don't in a certain way, that they are duped by, um, they're kind of put under some kind of spell that uh, runs all the way up to logical positivism, right? Uh, so anyway, sorry, go on. No, 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 that's, no. That, but yeah, that, 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 that refuses this as, um, on, 
not functioning or not present and so on. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I think he's also saying here that there's a difference between the subject of science and the subject qua speaking being. And that the subject qua speaking being has to sort of be that the subject of science has to account for, and that Descartes um, did a great service to the theory of the subject of science by affording the space of the doubting subject or i.e. The, the subject's intuition to be part and parcel with the scientific discourse it's, itself in, in a way. Um, so, okay. One last yeah. thing I had uh, regarding Euclidean geometry and Euclidean space is, um, well, this is particularly apposite given the fact that we're about to venture into, you know, the preliminaries to the formula of sexuation. And uh, of course, for these, for Lacan, these are defined against the background of what? Actual infinity. That's in fact what ensures their non complementarity as sets. Yes? For Euclid, Euclidean geometry and the Greeks, there was no real actual infinity. It was, uh, <laughs> if it was admitted, it was admitted only very reluctantly. The Greeks yeah. abhorred actual infinity. It's only with uh, actually the introduction of Renaissance perspective, uh, perspectiva, yeah. that you have the introduction of the actual infinity. You know, yeah. for Euclidean space, parallel lines never meet. But for yeah. perspectival, Renaissance perspectival space, parallel lines do meet precisely uh, through actualizing the infinite, where they do meet. Very interesting. Well, with that, I think we should move right along since we're going to get into the preliminaries of the. Thank you for that. Uh, please, sorry, one more comment. No, I just said thank you. It was all right. It was a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So where were we? We were here. Is that right? Naturally, is there anything? Or, or did I? Oh, no, here, sorry. Okay, the state, yes. So here he's talking about Hegel, the police and the state. The state and the police, for anyone who has reflected a little, one cannot say that Hegel takes up such a bad position in this regard, are exactly the same thing. It is based on a tetrahedric structure. In other words, once we put in question something like the letter, we have to leave my little schemas of last year, which, was, which were constructed as you remember like that. Okay. Here is the discourse of the master, as you perhaps remember, characterized by, by the fact that of the six lines of the tetrahedron, one is broken. Um, it is in the measure that one makes these structures turn on the four lines of the circuit that follow one another in the tetrahedron. This is a condition. They are fitted in the same direction. In this direction that turns around one, it does not matter which of the two others, of the three others, that the variation is established about what is involved in the structure of discourse. Very precisely insofar as it remains at a certain level of construction, which is the, which is the tetrahedric one. The tetrahedric one that we cannot be satisfied with once the agency of the letter is brought out. It is even because one cannot be satisfied with it that to remain at its level, there was always one of the sides of what makes the circle which is broken. So then it is from this that it results that in the world as it is structured by a certain tetrahedron, the letter only reaches its destination by finding the one who, in my discourse on the purloined letter, I designated by the term subject, which is not at all to be eliminated in any way or to be withdrawn on the pretext that we are making some steps in structure. And as regards which it is all the same necessary to start from the fact that if what we have discovered under the term the unconscious, if that has a meaning, well then the subject, I repeat, which is irreducible, we cannot even at this level, we cannot take it into account. But the subject is distinguished by its very special imbecility. <clears throat> this is what counts in post text because of the fact that it is not for nothing 
that the one whom he jokes about on this occasion is the king, who here manifests this function of subject. He understands absolutely nothing, and his whole police structure will not prevent, nevertheless, this letter coming from within his reach. Given that it is the police that are holding on to it, and that they can do nothing about it. I even underline that even if it were found in their files, it would be of no use to the historian. In one or other page of what I wrote in connection with this letter, one can say that very probably the only queen, that only the queen knows what it means. <coughs> Excuse me. And that what gives it its weight is the fact that if the only person that it involves, namely the subject, the king, got his hands on it, the only thing he would understand is that it surely has a meaning, and this is the scandal, that it has a meaning that escapes him, the subject. The term of scandal, or again, of contradiction, is in the right place in these last four pages that I gave you to read. I underline. It is clear that it is uniquely in function of the circulation of the letter that the minister, because there must have been all the same some people here who have read Poe sometime, you ought to know that there is a minister involved, the one who had nicked the letter, that the minister shows us in the course of the displacement of the aforesaid letter, variations, like a fish going through variations of color. And in truth, that it's essential function that my whole text plays on a little bit too much, but one cannot insist too much in order to make oneself understood, plays on the fact that the letter has a feminizing effect. He mentions this in the purloined letter, I remember this. But, and this is because um, um, it's outside of the law of the king. Like if the king establishes the phallic order and the king is in abeyance from possessing it, there's a feminizing effect on the other subjects, you see. Um, which is interesting. But once he no longer has the letter, because he knows nothing about it himself, once he no longer has it, we find him in a way restored to the dimension precisely that his whole plan was designed to give to himself, that of a man who dares all things. And I emphasize this turn of events. It is on this that the statement of Poe ends. It is that at this moment that the thing appears, monstrum horrendum, and it is put in the text, what he, what he wanted to be for the queen, who naturally had taken account of it because she tried to recover it, this letter. But anyway, the game was played out without him. This is for our Dupin, namely, the cutest of the cute, the one to whom Poe gives the role of throwing something that I would be quite happy to call, I underlined it in the text, some dust in our eyes. Namely, that we believe that the cutest of the cute exists. Namely, that he really understands, he really knows everything. And that being in the tetrahedron, he can understand how it is made. But I really want to talk about the use of cute here. Um, okay, let's continue though. I have sufficiently ironized about these certainly very clever things, namely the play on words around ambitus and religio and honesty and omens, to show and to say simply in my own regard that I went further in seeking out the little beast. Is that not so? And that in truth, it is somewhere. It is somewhere to follow Poe. One can ask the question of whether Poe really noticed it, namely that the simple fact of the letter passing through the hands of Dupin feminized him in his turn. Ah, this is why it's cute, okay. Enough to ensure that with respect to the minister, even though he nevertheless knows that he has deprived him of what might allow him to continue to play his role if ever he has to show his hand, it is precisely at this moment that Dupin cannot contain himself and manifests with respect to the one who is believed to be already sufficiently at his mercy in order to no longer leave a trace, sends him this message in the piece of paper that he substitutes for the stolen letter. Undestin si funest. Anyway, you know the text. 
Um, so, uh, what is this clandestine seafulness? This is um, the destiny. How, how is how would you translate that? Anybody? A horrifying destiny, maybe. I see. Thank you, Louise. Yeah. Um, interesting. Okay, so are we all clear? On this? So go ahead, go ahead. Such a dire phase. Aha, I see. <laughs> yes. So the, the term abeyance of souffrance is abeyance. It's not stolen. It's abeyance. Because Lacan clarifies that. So the letter is not stolen, it's kept in advance. And its destination is horrifying. And then how would you translate the final phrase here? Tiste is esteem de tiste. Anyways, we can come back to it. Okay. The question, as I might say, is to notice, as I might say, whether Poe on this occasion clearly sees the import of the fact that Dupin, in this sort of message, goes beyond all possibilities because God knows if the minister ever took out his letter and found himself at the same time deflated, this to tell you that castration is here, like it's suspended, perfectly realized. I am also indicating this perspective, which seems to me anyway, not to be determined in advance. This only gives a greater value to what Dupin writes as a message to the person that he has just deprived of what he thinks is his power. This little billet do, which makes him exult at the thought of what will happen when the person involved before whom to what end will have to make use of it. What one can say is that Dupin enjoys so then here's the question. The question that I opened up the last time by asking you whether the narrator and the one who writes are the same thing. What is incontestable is that the narrator, the subject of the statement, the one who speaks is Poe. Does Poe enjoy the enjoyment of Dupin or is it from elsewhere? This is what I'm going to try to show you today. I am speaking to you about the purloined letter as I articulated myself. This is an illustration that I can give to the question that I asked the last time. So he's, he's playing with the narrator and the subject of the statement. And he's asking a question which he says that he raised last time, but I'm having a hard time remembering if, in fact, if he did raise this last time. Does anybody remember? Because he's asking, okay, obviously, there's a kind of maybe masochistic enjoyment that Dupin is getting from staging the concealment of the souffrance of the letter. Okay, that's obvious. And then he's asking if, um, does Poe enjoy the enjoyment of Dupin? Okay, that's an interesting question. I don't yeah. see- Is he saying that a person, I'm oh, sorry, in terms of this, proxy of enjoyment, um, is that enjoyment through a proxy, is that something the hyster hysteric would do? Or is that a question of desire? I think what it is, is it's the question of the position of the subject in the drama of the purloined letter and the subject enjoys, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, he's asking, um, maybe as an author, does Poe have a, in what way does Poe relate to that in a certain sense? I, I was just interested in, in the idea of the narrator enjoying through proxy the enjoyment of the other. 
or a Dean Jones mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. of and yeah, how yeah, would that, that relate, might be part of it too. That might how be would that relate? How would that relate to subject? I, it was just a question that came to my head then. I mean, let's continue. I mean, like he, he talks yeah. later down at the bottom, he talks about cuckold. <laughs> so it's a, you know, it's a. Um, I was just wondering uh, what, what what's what modality. But well, this is a whole thing. This is a whole thing. Remember, why does he say that the police in the state, yeah, are are cuckolds? It's the same. It's the same reason. You remember, just last year, he says, seminar seventeen, that the master is the cuckold of history. The Hegelian master is the cuckold of history. Right, He's the right. cuck. He's the cuck of history. And of course, I, I shared that. <laughs> On Twitter with all of these, because I do a podcast with a guy who's adjacent to like thousands of um, incels. So sometimes my tweets go into incel world. It's very unfortunate. Uh, but they really liked this thesis of, of Lacan reading the phenomenology of spirit, <laughs> which is that the master is a cuck. Because for them, you know, um, everybody's cucked, I suppose. To some Everyone extent, is, yeah, yeah, extremely it's, online language of it's always it's, a question of, of the other yeah. enjoying and they're not, you know, it's I, but yeah, I can, but it, everyone in some sense, yeah, like it fits their kind of quasi philosophy, which is like even the Chad will eventually be cucked, right? He can only be a Chad for kind of a fleeting moment or something like some ruse of history it's a femoral, isn't it it's a femoral, it's a femoral yeah it's some, when they lose when they lose frame down. that's it when they lose frame then it all goes wrong you know but it makes sense though because i always am interested in the masochism of southern fiction writers you know like uh, and, what's uh, it, like um, like poe himself like um it's a motif in american southern literature especially because it's legacy of slavery and the horrors of it and so on for authors to play with kind of really ma- really masochistic universes and can, can kind of construct them, you know? Yeah. Um, any, anyways, I'm not a master on Poe. Like in Wise Blood, that, that's, you know, have you, have you um, you've, you've read that, who, who wrote that? It was McCarthy, was it? But uh, he ta- talks about, uh, he's a Cormac creature. Cormac McCarthy? It's Flannery. That's, it's Flannery, it's Flannery, Flannery that's the one. Flannery yeah, O'Connor. That's a woman. That's a, thank you. Uh, but Wise Blood Preacher goes around preaching about. Uh, There's a great he, film by, of that, by the way. I know. Really? It's really got really? Brad Dourif in it. It's fantastic. You know, it's, wow. uh, I'm gonna make um, a note of that. Thank you. But the preacher goes around, and you know, you don't you don't need God because you can have a car. You know, and he talks about this uh, mm. uh, you, you know, and this idea of enjoyment. I think no, you're Very right about this idea of the, the sort of gothic construction. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's. It's hard. It's it's a difficult thing for me. Anyways, it's a whole. I, other. I actually I think just to add that to your original question, Daniel, is that you asked like what had we talked about last week, which was the difference between the narrator and the author. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. His question is: Is the author enjoying, or right. is the narrator enjoying? Is Poe enjoying, right. or is just his narrator? Which is also your right to say part of Southern Gothic literature is yeah. a- exactly that. Does the author enjoy the masochistic violence that they yeah. create? Do they enjoy that violence themselves? Yeah. Or is it just a literary tool, right? And I think that's yeah. Part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you for that's, that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really like, great. I'm asking about that line. Uh, the, 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 I have a translation, if, if it's helpful at all. The, the, um, the Ignatius. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Please. Yeah, I, this, was, this, is, this goes along with enjoyment and cuckoldom and stuff like that. Uh, great. So it's, I have this from my, from the Portland letter that I read today. So infamous a scheme, if not worthy of Atreus, is worthy of Theistus. The lines from Atreus is, it's a reference. The lines from Atreus's monologue in Act 5, Scene 5 of Crebelon's play refer to his plan to avenge himself by serving his brother the blood of the latter's own son to drink. So just on stuff of like blood and enjoyment. And I, I don't know if that's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, Got it. Thank you very much, John. Very good. Um, okay. This is really, really salient stuff. I mean, right now, in <laughs> terms of, you know, it really is in terms of questioning about who enjoys, yeah. why yeah, they enjoy, yeah, especially yeah. online, you know, where yeah. we're being thrust back into, you know, this this space where we can't leave our rooms. We're always online. We're engaging yeah. with people who we're always assuming are, are acting in bad faith. So we automatically right. assume, well, what are they up to? Why, what, what are they enjoying? And, 
you know, I, I think that this question of the narrator and are they enjoying and how right. others, what they, it's, it's really, really say it's, 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 I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, it's, really it's kind of, it's kind of like the dialectic of based and cringe, you know, is, <laughs> is uh, in a certain sense, there is the fact that the Southern Gothic discourse has a, um, tethers itself to the cringe as a necessity. And you have to ask yourself, like, is there even a, a sort of liberated based? This doesn't seem like there is really. Only the only degree to which there's a liberated base is this ephemeral kind of moment in which you have a kind of revenge, kind of revanche, revanchist structure, right? Okay. Yeah. So I, I get, I get, I, I, um, I struggle with that literature in part from a kind of very naive humanistic standpoint sometimes personally, um, just because I have, I have a hard time with discourses of masochism. I, I, I really enjoy, thank you for reminding me of you all, I'm just tired and forgot my book. I really like Flannery O'Connor. I mean, I, I okay, I, I've, okay. Yeah, but that's, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. You gotta carry on. We gotta carry, and we gotta carry on, okay. Gotta carry on. Okay. I just want to mention one thing that resonant resonates with somewhat in you know structuralist analysis in the '60s. They would talk about things like um, the um, the action of the structure, yeah, being you know an important key thing. So it's neither humanist nor you know the character or the author. And so he's trying to pinpoint here. You know, when he says, "Does Poe enjoy? Do Pan enjoy?" And then he's trying to pinpoint that it's from elsewhere. You know, yeah. the other that it's really a dialectical action, and you know, yeah. structuralists in the seventies and eighties would talk about things like, or feminists would talk about things like um, that. We mult that the reader reader response identifies with multiple elements going on. They would try to get beyond some of the structuralist analysis yes. in the sixties and say that we identify with multiple, you know, things going on, including like in horror movies, like in Holly, Hall Halloween. We identify with the killer. We identify with the the person being killed, yes. with the cinematic apparatus, etc. So there's multiple things going on. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that, just to say that I think yeah. what Lacan is getting at here is not so much a kind of multiple deconstructivist sort of thing of like there's multiple points of view at all times, but that there is a really a dialectical action that there is a kind of um, and elsewhere that one does sort of, I almost say identify with, come out with something. It's not Dupont's point of view that we identify with. It's not Poe's yeah. point that we identify with. It's right. something we take from it elsewhere than yeah. one or the other. We do transfer than one or the other. It's something else we identify with. That's what he's trying to get us to see. Anyway, I just want to note that. That's really good, Andy. Thank you. I, I haven't read the story, but it looks to me that it's Tupin, of course, takes the role of the analyst, right? And so if we follow it, right, and the, the quote in French, too, is, is not, uh, I translate it, it's not uh, dignified for the other, but dignified, but it's for, for you. So isn't that the creation of, the new, of a new subject, right? It's not for the king, but it's actually like, trying to change the structure that was going on in that story. At least. I don't know the story, but I guess it's going actually is for you, the queen. I don't know the story, so, but that's just my supposition. The creation yeah. of, new, of a new subject of, uh, because also in the, in the, in the creed, the Puran letter, it talks about how you can rewrite the center uh, and to, to write it as uh, going to, uh, to the Virgin, something like that. I don't know where it's, what it is to the address um, in order to, to free the virgin space in which to write a new address. This is in 35, the, the prolonged letter. That's very helpful, Luis, yeah. I, let's, let's continue the thing. I don't know how much, I think this is actually a longer day. So I'd like to make sure we, we have a half an hour left. Um, Okay, this has been great so far. Okay. I'm speaking to you about the Perlone letter as I articulated it myself. This is an illustration that I can give to the question that I asked the last time. Um, 
is the one who writes not radically different from the one who speaks in his own name as the narrator in a writing. This level, it is tangible because what happens at the level of the narrator when all is said and done is what I could call, I apologize for insisting on the demonstrative character of this little essay, is that when all is said and done, it is the most perfect castration that is demonstrated. Everyone is equally cuckolding and no one knows anything about it. It is certain that the king, of course, is asleep from the beginning and will sleep to the end of his days without noticing anything. The queen does not realize that she is almost fitted to become mad about this minister now that she has him in her grasp, now that she has castrated him, right? It's love. The minister has really been had. But when all is said and done, it doesn't matter to him. Because as I very cl clearly explained somewhere, it is either one thing or another. Either he will be happy to become the queen's lover, and that ought to be agreeable in principle. People say that. Not everybody likes it. Or if really he has for her one of these feelings, which are of the order of what I, for my part, call the only lucid feeling, namely hatred. Uh, uh, as I very clearly explained to you, if he hates her, she will only love him all the more. And that will allow him to go so far that he will end up all the same by becoming sure that the letter has not been there for a long time. Because he will surely make a mistake. He will tell himself that if she goes that far with him, it's because she is sure of things. So then, he will open his little paper in time, but in no case will he get back to what he wished for. The fact is that the minister will end up by making himself ridiculous. He will not be so. Good. Well then, there you are. Here is what I succeeded in saying in connection with what I wrote and what I wanted to tell you. It is that it takes on its importance from the fact that it is unreadable. That's the point, which if you would not mind listening to me again, I am going to try to develop. Like many people, I'm saying it to you right away because there are worldly people, the only people who are capable of telling me what they think about what I palm off on them. It was at a time when my accrete had not yet appeared. They gave me their point of view as technicians. Quote, we can't understand anything in it, they told me. Note that this is quite something, something that one understands nothing about. It's full of hope. It is the sign that one is affected by it. It is a good thing that they understand nothing about it because one can never understand anything except what, of course, one has already had in one's head. But anyway, I'd like to articulate a little better. It is not enough to write something that is deliberately incomprehensible, but to see why the unreadable has a meaning. I would point out to you, first of all, that our whole business, which is the story of sexual relationships, is it not, revolves around the fact that you may think that it is written, because in short, this is what was discovered in psychoanalysis. We were all the same clearly referred to a writing. The Oedipus complex is a written myth. And I would say even more, this is very exactly the thing that specifies it. One could have taken precisely anyone at all, provided it was written. What is proper to a myth that is written, as Levi Strauss has already pointed out, is that by writing it, it has only a single form. What is proper to myth as the whole work of Levi Strauss tries to demonstrate is to have a great deal of them. That is what a written myth constitutes a myth. So then this written myth might very well seem to be the inscription of what is involved in sexual relationships. I would like all the same to point out a certain number of things to you. There you are. The fact is that for that, it is not a matter of indifference that I started from this tense. The fact is that if this letter, this letter on this occasion may have this function, this feminizing function, is that not so? It is with respect to what I told you about the fact that the written myth, the Oedipus complex, is designed very exactly to highlight that it is unthinkable to say the woman. Okay. Why is it unthinkable? Because one cannot say all the women. And we know by now this whole notion of the exception of Trissant's of the primal father and how this renders um, the category of the feminine as um, ineligible from the all in this instance. 
One cannot, because the conditions of the myth are set by the primal father in a way, we know that, okay. One cannot say all the women because it is only introduced into the myth because of the fact that the father possesses all the women, which is manifestly a sign of an impossibility. On the other hand, what I underline in connection with this proline letter is that there is only one woman. That in other words, the function of the woman is only deployed in what the great mathematician Brouwer, in the context of what I stated for you, put forward earlier about the mat mathematical discussion called multi-unity, multi-unité, namely, that there is a function which is very properly speaking, that the father is there, the father is there because he makes himself recognized in his radical function, in the one he has always manifested every time, for example, monotheism was at stake. It is not for nothing that Freud landed. Um, I gotta come back to this later, sorry. Um, it is not for nothing that Freud landed on this because there is an altogether essential function that should be reserved as being at the very origin, properly speaking of writing. This is what I will call the not more than one. Okay, the not more than one. Aristotle, of course, makes altogether entrancing considerable efforts as he usually does to make this accessible, accessible to us by stages in the name of his principle that can be described as the principle of climbing the ladder from cause to cause and from being to being. You really do have to stop somewhere. Anyway, what is very nice is that he really spoke for imbeciles. Hence the development of the function of the subject. The not more than one is posited in an altogether original way. Without the not more than one, you could not even begin to write the series of whole numbers. So the not more than one is playing off of this. Um, okay, this is interesting. This is this this is actually now coming to help elucidate these questions with Euclid and Descartes and intuition that we looked at before, right? Especially with this notion of imbecility, right? I will show you that on the board the next time there must be a one. And then all you have to do subsequently is purse your lips anytime you want to start again. So that each time this gives a further one, but not the same one. On the contrary, all those that are repeated in this way are the same. It can be added up. That is called an arithmetical series. But let us come back to what seems to us essential for this subject as regards sexual enjoyment. It is that from experience, there's only one structure. Whatever may have to be the particular conditionings, it is that sexual enjoyment is found not to be able to be written. And it is from this that there results the structural multiplicity, which Andrew was just mentioning, by the way. And first of all, the tetrahedron in which something is outlined that situates it, but is inseparable from a certain number of functions that have nothing to do in short that can specify in the general case, the sexual partner. Can you imagine, by the way, somebody uttering in speech a sentence that is loaded with this much uh, richness? <laughs> this is incredible. I mean, <clears throat> wow. We could reread this several times. Okay, let, let us actually reread this very quickly for our, all of our benefits. All right. It is that from experience, there's only one structure. Whatever may have to be the particular conditionings, it is that sexual enjoyment is found not to be able to be written. And it is from this that there results the structural multiplicity. Okay. So without it, you wouldn't have the multiplicity, mm -hmm. I suppose. And first of all, the tetrahedron in which something is outlined that situates it, but is inseparable from a certain number of functions that have nothing to do in short, that can specify in the general case, the sexual partner. So in that sense, when Aristotle makes a move from 
um, his theory of say metaphysics um, up the ladder, he doesn't account for this um, gap in between the stratification of these different zones of function of the truth. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I suppose that generally makes sense. Um, go ahead, I heard somebody go. I guess the, the way I interpreted the, you know, Aristotle reference was the prime mover. It's so moving up to one prime mover, prima mov, movens, mov, yes. Um, but it's also at stake, of course, with Aristotle, it's Lacan's it pains to disjoin existence and essence here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. The prime mover, um, well, what is the prime mover? I mean, the prime mover is a principle of energy at a, at a, at a finite source in the universe, which generates as a precondition the development of, um, of, 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 of ontological thereness of all things, right? And, and also functions as a kind of sustaining mechanism for the order of the universe. But it's, it's, actually, it's actually, I really like Aristotle's theory of the prime mover because it's very kind of sci-fi in a sense. I've always thought of it, if you actually look at like the map of the universe of Aristotle, it's really weird. I mean, it's so different than the Christian conception of the universe in the sense that um, because he's not working with the category of infinity, um, the prime mover is basically something in which all beings uh, seek a certain kind of natural comportment to, to a harmonious orientation to it. Yeah, it's and question then, it's participation, um, which is yeah, brought yeah, out yeah, with, yeah. With, with, totally. with, with Thomas Aquinas. And I think, uh, but obviously that's, that's uh, Thomas Aquinas' appropriation of Aristotle is completely different because... Uh, he has a different conception of infinity and, and well, but in terms of you know when he's talking about the not what was that term the more than one can you go back to it just um, no more than one the no more than one no is it in one. seminar not more not more than not one. more than one where he talks about the yeah. not two he talks about right. the not right so, right so the way I read this was okay prime mover the way I read that is exception that founds essence it is an exception that makes joins existence to essence. In that way, it functions like the primal father. And then the note, not more than one, founding a, a, an arithmetical series. That's Frege. That's his theory of natural number formation, is the no, not more than one. You know, the, 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 the zero number is, the zero is counted as a zero object. And that founds the yeah, one. Yeah, and yeah, that generates yeah. the series of nice. arithmetical numbers. Um, for the Greeks, they didn't have uh, the number zero. Uh, that's maybe we can think how uh, the prime mover was not lacking. That's like kind of right. think that that's right. what right. generates all the desire. Right, right. Okay, it makes sense that um, there is a theory of disharmony, but um, and there is a theory of void and so on. So you have a kind of theory of the negative in, in the cosmos of Aristotle, but you still, um, but, but Lacan is saying that the, even in, 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 in modern science, post Frege, as well as in Descartes, that the, the non-written status of the absent sexual relation is still, of course, animating, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just there. Okay, let's, let's continue, um, okay. The structure is such that man as such, insofar as he functions, is castrated. And on the other hand, something exists at the level of the feminine partner that one can simply trace out by this feature, whose importance I highlight the whole function of this letter on this occasion, that the woman has nothing to do with it, if she exists. Now, that is why she does not exist. It is insofar as the woman has nothing to do with the law. And this we remember is what Dupin, 
that was so cute at doing. Remember why? Because he rendered all of the subjects within the drama as feminine. I think actually Dupin was not an attractive person. So he's cute by being, by feminizing, I guess. The uh, word cute has two meanings here. It, the word cute can mean shrewd and clever yeah. okay. as well. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's no, he's, he's playing on, on both of these things. It's an old saying in Liverpool, cute, cute is a barrel full of monkeys, which means that you're, you're very clever, but it's, uh, it's what's yeah. called, he's playing on, on, the, on yeah. both words of attractiveness yeah. and being okay. intelligent. So he's not, not just... Right, 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 right. Okay, okay, that's all. But what is the French? Mignon? Or, or what? Because, you know, it's in French. We don't have it in front of us at the moment, but um, I, think yeah, yeah. Mark's, <laughs> I think that Mark's comment is, is helpful. I mean, either way, it doesn't quite matter because I don't think that he's referring to cute as in um, attractive or something like this or cute like a baby or something mm. like this. What What's the, the um, is, is there a paragraph or anything that will make it easier to find? If I look in the, I, I was curious about the French. Specifically on this point? Yeah. Sure. For the, well, for where he says cute. Um, yeah, let me see if I can find it very quickly. Well, I mean, sorry, and then I'll go. I'll, I'll, I want to get move, get on with it myself. I right. will send it to you later, and we can find it for next time we meet. We will we will present the answer. How about that? So that we can finish in time. Is that okay? Yeah, I I I, I um. Um, maybe later we could talk about the value of reading uh, with the French, but let's let's continue. You mean like a, alongside? Uh, so. Yeah, I find it very helpful to, to to keep the French close. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, we can do it. I think I think it would be it would be smart. So let's. I've That's got definitely... all the French. If I, I, I've got all of the uh, the summary, yeah. so I can upload yeah. them if I to a Dropbox. I've got them on my other laptop somewhere. I can, if anyone needs them, I've got them. Yeah, I mean, I think the screen share would prevent making them both visible, but having it available, yeah, in another PDF that we can pull up would be would be good. All right, I'll try and dig that out, and, and uh, I'll. Um, I, 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 I should have it as well. Actually, I do, I do have it. So, but nonetheless, feel free. Okay. How are we to conceive of what has happened? All the same, we make love, right? All the same, we make love and people have noticed from the time they became interested in it for a long time. And people have perhaps always been interested in it. Only we have lost the key to the way in which people were previously interested. But for us at the heart, in the efflorescence of the scientific era, we learn what is involved in it through Freud. What is it? When what is at stake is to structure, to make function by means of symbols, the sexual relationship, what creates an obstacle to it? It is that enjoyment gets mixed up, mixed up in it. Can sexual enjoyment be treated directly? It cannot be. And it is for this reason, let us say, let us say no more, that there is the word. Um, and I did highlight the cute passage, so I should be able to find it easily, kind of, by the way. Okay. Discourse begins from the fact that there is a gap, from the fact that here there is a gap. Okay, we cannot remain at that. I mean that I reject any position of origin. And after all, nothing prevents us from saying that. It is because discourse begins that the gap is produced. It is a matter of complete indifference for the result. And the reason there, I think, on origin is the same reason why you would have an origin if you had a kind of meta-language thesis on language. But rather, it's the fact of there, there being things said, right? It's, it, does, it doesn't, the origin of discourse doesn't sort of have some idealist uh, sort of Archimedean point, 
I think is the, the notion here. What is certain is that the discourse is implied in the gap. And since there is no meta, oh, see, there he goes. And since there is no meta language, it cannot get out of it. The symbolization of sexual enjoyment, as is made obvious by what I am in the process of articulating, is the fact that it borrows all its symbolism from what? From what does not concern it, namely from enjoyment. <clears throat> Insofar as it is prohibited by certain confused things, confused but not all that much, because we have managed to articulate it perfectly under the name of the pleasure principle which can only have one meaning, not too much enjoyment. Because the stuff of every enjoyment is close to suffering. This is even how we recognize how it is dressed up. If the plant was not manifestly suffering, we would not know that it was alive. It is clear then that the fact that sexual enjoyment only found as a way to structure itself, the reference to prohibition as named of enjoyment, but an enjoyment which is not the one, which is this dimension of enjoyment, which is properly speaking a fatal enjoyment. In other words, that sexual enjoyment takes on its structure from the prohibition laid on the enjoyment directed at one's own body, namely very precisely at this crunch point the frontier where it is close to mortal enjoyment. And it only reconnects with the dimension of the sexual by bringing a prohibition to bear on the body from which one's own body emerges, namely the body of the mother. It is only in this way that there is structure, that there is connected up in discourse, what alone the law can contribute to it, what is involved in sexual enjoyment. Okay. Very significant. It only reconnects with the dimension of the sexual by bringing a prohibition to bear on the body. It is only in this way that there is structured that there is connected up in this course. Okay, so, so if the letter and the enjoyment of the scene of the purloined letter, and you all can go back and read it if you haven't read it before, it's not exactly caught up within its, for most of the, of the, of the um, story, it's happening outside of the law. So that's very interesting in its own way. And it's almost like something is brought to conclusion or is rather revealed about the status of the law within the scene otherwise. So it's almost like a scene rendered other other to itself in a way. Okay. The partner on this occasion is indeed in effect reduced to one, but not just anyone whatsoever, the one who gave birth to you. And it is around this that there is constructed everything that can be articulated once we enter the field in a way that can be verbalized. When we shall have advanced further, I will come back to the way in which knowledge comes to function as enjoying. We can skip it here. The woman as such finds herself in this position uniquely assembled because of the fact that she is, I would say, subject to the word. Naturally, I am sparing you the details that the word is what establishes a dimension of truth. The impossibility of this sexual relationship is indeed also what gives its import to the word in the fact, of course, that it can do everything except be of use at the point where it happens. The word strives to reduce the woman to subjection, namely to make of her something from which one expects signs of intelligence, if I can put it this way. But naturally we are not dealing with any real being here. To say the word, the woman on this occasion, as this text is designed to prove, the woman, I mean the woman in herself, the woman as if one could say all the women, the woman, I insist, who does not exist, is precisely the letter. The letter insofar as she is the signifier that there is no other. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, wow. Um,
So this is, uh, you know, I mean, just this is great stuff for the whole yeah. because I, when he's writing, you know, Akhi, he's very much in the whole structuralist um, time. You know, he's, he's writing about desire. And then he's taken that, you know, he's, take, he's taking the this work and he's bringing it into the time when he's d- developing ideas about the drive and jouissance and other jouissance. Right. You know, and that, that, you know, in terms of, it's really good the way he, 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 he hasn't just left the stuff, but he's brought it back in. Uh, and he, you know, he's, he's talking about, but in terms of how he's speaking about enjoyment and right. how he's, how he's speaking about, you know, can you, uh, sorry, can you move that back up a little bit for me? Yeah, 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 yeah. But all the women, women, this idea of um, withheld enjoyment, this idea of, the the woman doesn't exist i mean for, for me reading about you know there is no such thing as as a sexual relationship in my own reading and my yeah. own research that the the idea that uh, there is no such thing as you know this this blissful this blissful uh, ecstatic experience of the one there is no unity there is no moment no no uh, full sexual enjoyment that comes mm-hmm. from this momentary um uh, uh, integration or interpolation of, of subjectivity right. into into a deity or god there is no there is no such thing as that but there is an enjoyment still and the enjoyment comes from a type of writing that stems from perpetual failure um and it's that that fa- the failure of the sexual relationship or the failure uh, is what allows writing to be and uh, lacan's constantly at pains to be able to express this and I just, I'm really, I'm really, pretty, uh, you know, now it's all sort of coming together in terms of how he's brought in uh, the purloined letter. Anyway, I was just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm rattling, but I just think it's, it's really, yeah. you know, thank I, you. I agree. I wonder what people think about this invocation of the up above here, where he, he gives, of course, a very concise definition of the pleasure principle, which is precisely the kind of management of not an excess of enjoyment, but then the way that um, every body is marked by the prohibitionary status that this excess enjoyment marks on the body. And that this then opens up the question of the law as well as positions the subject towards the maternal. And so there's a certain, there's a certain presentation of the law in relationship to the maternal it's so everyone's but, marked for enjoyment, or is that is that what it's saying that we have a mark of a lack of enjoyment? Yeah, I mean, um, he says it is only in this way that there is structure, that there is connected up in discourse, what alone the law can contribute to it. What is involved in sexual enjoyment? The partner on this occasion is indeed, in effect, reduced to one, but not just anyone whatsoever, the one who gave birth to you, right? So, um, and it is around this that there is constructed everything that can be articulated once we enter the field in a way that can be verbalized. So it is in this sense that he's talking about the way that the name of the father puts a metaphor into the dosting of the mother, right? So the, there's something about the way of the prohibitionary excess of enjoyment flings the subject into the maternal, which as we know from the seminar on ethics is of the status of a kind of um, impossible enjoyment, mm-hmm. which, which itself uh, struggles with getting into speech, which is why the psychotic is caught there, right? It's caught within the kind of babble of the mom, right? In a way, and why the father helps metaphorize out of it Mm-hmm. makes an exit out of it in some sense so i think that this is classic psychoanalysis he's rehashing for us in a certain way um on the one hand on the other hey, hand i think Aaron wants to say something is it, is it did you want to oh, say i was going to say very precisely he the algorithm like uh draws up i think in subversion of the subject but it's also in seminar five Name of the father signifies desire of the mother as the phallus. 
it is what is engenders the phallus as the mm -hmm. signifier of signified in general. Now, obviously, we're past name the father as the other of the other, um, because Platon doesn't, in fact, conjecture. It is the other as such, the other in any way. Yes. True. Yeah, Just I a small mean. Like, little point, because you know we're yeah. circling around the phallus so much here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And then, but then he makes a so he, he articulates this general structure about the relation of law and maternal and all of that. But then he says, when we shall have advanced further, I'll come back to the way in which knowledge comes to function as enjoined. The woman, as such, finds herself in this position uniquely assembled. This is the unique status qua, the mm, status of the exception and the not all. Naturally, I am sparing you the detours that the word is what establishes a dimension of truth. The impossibility of this sexual relationship is indeed also what gives its import to the word and the fact, of course, that it can do everything except be use, be of use at the point where it happens. Okay. So uh, there's, he goes from the word to the letter to uh, this signify that there is no other, which is the letter. Um, but naturally we're not dealing with any real being here. To say the word, the woman on this occasion, so here the woman is the word, as this text is designed to prove, the woman in herself, I could say all the women, the woman, I insist who does not exist, is precisely the letter. Okay. Okay. Isn't this like, I remember when Shishek talks about Batman, right? Of the myth of Harvey, right? Uh, that we should preserve the myth that Harvey Dent, Harvey Dent I think, right? Uh, yeah. Was actually a good man, right? A good uh, yeah. uh, mayor. So yeah. we should hide this, this secret in the same way that this only works in the story, in this story, only works because the letter is hiding, right? It's the fantasy uh -huh. that is created. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> In the way that only we can grasp grasp object yeah. detail with a fantasy. So that's that's confusing to me because I'm not clear on whether the drama of the story is in fact a topsy turvy world. I think that's actually what it is. On the contrary, it's all subject positions deprived of the phallus and conditioned to the cuteness of the feminine. So they have all of these, their imbecility is more revealed as a result. It's not concealed, you see? It's not in its proper place. And that's why it's a fun thing. You see my point? So I think actually the Prolon letter is different than the Batman example, precisely because the sacrifice of Dent permitted the circulation of a phallic order, as far as I understand of the city of God. Yeah, yeah, that sense, yes. Okay, but, I, but m m anyways, okay. So now he wants to say something about Aristotelian logic. You have the affirmatives. I'm not going to put them in the usual letters of formal logic. I am not writing A, I am, I am writing the universal affirmative. And I am writing this as universal negative. This is what that means. I write here particular affirmative and particular negative. I would like to point out that at the level of Aristotelian articulation is between these two poles particular affirmative and particular negative. Um, because it is from Aristotle that these propositional categories are borrowed, it is between these two poles that logical discrimination is carried out. The universal affirmative states in essence, I insisted often enough in the past about what is involved in the statement, every stroke is vertical, and that it is perfectly compatible with the fact that no stroke exists. The essence is essentially situated in logic. It is a pure statement of discourse. Logical discrimination, its essential axis in this articulation, is very exactly this oblique axis that I've just noted here. Okay, that makes sense. Nothing runs contrary to any, and okay, now this makes perfect sense because what he was saying before is that it's this, kind of empty universal 
which permits Aristotle to construct all of these, so to speak, discourses that are uh, almost not, not tautological, but almost self-referential in a certain way, are grounded on the legitimation of their own uh, logical proposition, of their own function. You see what I'm saying? So that, okay, that I'm, I'm following this. Surprisingly, <laughs> nothing runs contrary to any identifiable logical statement whatsoever. Nothing except the remark that, quote, there are some that do not. A particular negative, there are some strokes that are not vertical. This is the only contradiction that can be made against the affirmation that it is a matter of the essence. Okay. And the two other terms are in the functioning of Arista, of Arista and logic quite secondary. Namely, quote, there are those that a particular affirmative and afterwards how can we know if it is necessary or not this proves nothing and to say quote there are none that which is not the same thing as to say quote there are some who are not namely this is the universal negative there are none that well that proves nothing either it is a fact what i can point out to you is what happens when from this original science logic we pass to their transposition in mathematical logic, the one that is constructed by means of what are called quantifiers. Um, the universal, I was saying, the universal affirmative is now going to be written in this universalizable notation. It is an A, capital A, upside down. I say an A upside down anyway. It is not part of discourse, it is writing but it is a signal as you are going to see in order to be able to babble on. Um, so function X, the universal affirmative, X, F. Okay, here particular affirmative. So now he's, we would benefit from, we, well, we can all see it, um, but he's making the transition here to the difference uh, in the way that these are now inscribed as writing versus as statements of logic. Okay, writing versus speech. Um, I want to express that this is a negative. How can I do so? I'm struck by the fact that it has never really been articulated the way that I'm going to do it. What you have to do is to put a bar of negation above the FX and not at all as is usually done above both. You're going to see why. And here it is on the X that you have to put the bar. So he puts the bar there. Okay. What I'm putting forward is that in this way of writing precisely, everything depends on what one can say about writing. And that the distinction in two terms, united by a point from what is written in this way, has the value of saying that one can say about every X, it is the signal of the upside down A, that it satisfies what is written, FX that it is not displaced into it in the same way, but with a different accent. The fact that there is something unwritable, namely that it is here, that the emphasis of writing is brought to bear. There exists X's that you can make function in FX, of which you then speak that what is at stake in what is here called a quantifying transposition by means of the quantifiers of the particular. On the other hand, it's true that it is around writing that there pivots the displacement of the distribution, namely that for what is put in the foreground is acceptable. Nothing has changed for the universal. It still has its value, even though it is not the same value. On the contrary, what is at stake here? The cleavage consists in noticing the non-value of the universal negative. Okay. Oh, it's already six after. Boy, that went quickly. So I propose that we uh, we're almost done, but let us say this. I feel as if this section, that I'll make a mark here and we pick things up before we start the next day, we pick things up here fresh as my, my proposal to you all. As, um, Sounds good to me. Yeah. Let's say final part. Okay, very good. All right, my friends. Let me say one thing before we break. Um, so I was thinking that 
Um, if you all are interested, uh, one of the activities that we might do in the future is a, um, a reading group on the Marxist text. Um, precisely the principle of hope by Ernst Bloch. The, I'd, be, I'd, I'd, I'd be very, very interested in that. Yeah. Warm stream Marxism. Yeah. <laughs> Warm stream. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. If anybody's interested, I think it would be really fun. I, I just wrote an essay on libidinal economy and what Bloch has to say about Freud is great stuff. Um, and really is good because uh, he kind of writes about Freudian theory in a way like no other Marxist does and takes very bold leaps and proposes some very interesting conceptual uh, notions, but leaves a lot undone. So I feel like it would lend itself to a great study group because there's all of these ideas that just get unloaded not fully developed right and so it could be it could be it could be a good collaborative text to work on as an idea i uh, i i briefly